Hey, praise the Lord. Brother Clinton here once again. Welcome back to my office and welcome back to the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth as Jesus Christ commanded. Praise the Lord. You're probably wondering why in the world Brother Clinton is making a public video about the subject of sexual intimacy between a man and his wife. This is something that um, several people in time past have asked me to make a video about and I have not felt led to led of the Spirit of, of Christ to make a public video about it until today and the reason is because two different people who don't know each other wrote to me this afternoon and asked me the exact same question I mean the exact same question you both know who you are but you don't know that somebody else wrote to me today and asked me the exact same question that you did um, the first one was a brother who asked me about this, and I sent him an email, and I explained to him from the scripture the answer to his question briefly. And I told him uh, in the letter, in the email, I said, perhaps it would be a good idea for me to actually pray about making a public video to explain these things. Um, even though YouTube is not the church, you know, I, I said that it might be a good idea actually for me to pray about that. And then maybe about two hours later, um, a woman wrote me and she asked me the same question and so here I am knowing that it was the will of God for me to do this and to address this issue I want to say a few things right up front um, YouTube is not the church and so I fully realize that whoever you may be watching this you, you may or may not be a Christian and that's fine you're welcome to watch this video listen to the things that are explained therein that you may learn of the Word of God However, if you have a different opinion than God, the comment forum in this section isn't going to be a place for you to express your opinion if you disagree with God's word. The comment forum also is not a place for you to post links to other articles or ministries. Okay? Any, any comment that has a link in it is going to be deleted. I don't allow links to other ministries in the comment forum here because that causes confusion. Also, the comment forum is not going to be a place for you to use profanity, foul language, or anything uh, unacceptable for public view. Okay, I thought about making the comments unavailable for this video, but then I thought, you know, yeah, that shouldn't be necessary. So all comments are subject to my approval, that no comment can appear here unless it is first seen and approved by me. Um, that's because I'm a Christian, and this is a Christian ministry. And so I trust that we can all be ladies and gentlemen here and that we can understand that the purpose that I'm making this video and hopefully the purpose that you're watching this video is to learn more about what God says about the sexual intimacy between a man and his wife. Praise the Lord. First of all, we shouldn't need to say that um, married couples are one man and one woman. That's what a married couple consists of, a man and a woman married to each other in a blood covenant. Of marriage and um, that has nothing to do with a state minister or a state contract or a marriage license it has to do with a man making a vow before God and then taking a woman the woman into his marriage bed and cons consummating his vow to her and then she becomes his wife and what God therefore hath joined together let not man be put asunder so having said that if you'd like to learn more about the issue of marriage and divorce there is an entire playlist on this channel that will show you from the scripture um, everything that God says about marriage and divorce, remarriage and adultery, fornication, things like that. That's not the subject here. The subject here is what is or is not appropriate between a man and his wife. And there are some that feel that certain things are inappropriate. There are others that feel that those certain things are appropriate. And I want to share with you some things from the scripture to show you what the Bible says about this issue. Okay, If you're a Christian and you believe the Word of God, let's get in the Word of God and find out what the Bible says. Praise the Lord. So come with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is commonly known as the, the marriage chapter because it's part of a letter that was written from Paul the Apostle of Christ to the church at Corinth, and the entire 7th chapter deals with the subject of marriage, and which is why... You know, Paul began in, in verse 1 saying, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And then he goes on to explain about, about marriage. And so it's evident that the, the Corinthian church wrote to Paul before this and asked him some things because he said, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. And so he was answering the things that they had written unto him about. And so he goes on to say, 
Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Okay? Praise the Lord. This is the reason why men and women get married. All right? God said in the very beginning, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will create and help meet for him. And so God made an help meet for Adam, a suitable servant for Adam. That's what help meet means. Uh, and help means someone to serve him. And meet means someone that is suitable. Okay? So an help meet for Adam was a suitable servant for him, someone to serve him, someone to please him. It wasn't good that the man should be alone. So Paul says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Why do men and women get married? Why does a man take a wife? Is it so he can have someone to cook his dinner for him? No, not really. He could probably cook his dinner for himself. Or if he didn't know how to cook dinner for himself, he could probably pay someone to do that. Okay, It's a beautiful and a wonderful thing that a wife does prepare dinner for her husband. And that's part of her duty as his helpmeet, but that's not why she's there. Okay, she's there because she's a woman and he is a man. And in order to avoid fornication, God has ordained that every man should have his own wife and every woman should have her own husband. Why? To avoid fornication. To avoid fornication. This is what the Word of God says. Men and women have natural sexual desires within ourselves that will lead us to sin against God by committing fornication if we don't have someone with us in a blood covenant in order to experience those things with, in order to share those things with. The reason that men and women get married to each other is because of sexual intimacy. That is the reason. Of all the other things that men and women share in a covenant of marriage, those things can be shared between two best friends. You know, talking, friendship, going places together, eating meals together, helping one another. You know, uh, one provides for the other, the other serves the other. The, those things can be found in any friendship. The thing that differentiates a marriage between a man and a woman with or from a, a, any other kind of relationship, a friendship, is sexual intimacy. That's why men and women marry each other, to avoid fornication, because we all need sexual intimacy. And so God ordained marriage between a man and a woman. God created the, the, the woman. He made woman and brought her to the man. He made her in a certain way so that she would be beautiful and attractive to the man, so that she could please him sexually, intimately. Okay, and it's not just a one-way street. She enjoys it as well. She is created with that desire in herself as well. Okay, this is why men and women marry each other. And the fruit of that sexual desire that is in them and the result of putting them together in a covenant of marriage is that they bear children. Okay? God has created our bodies in a certain way that we are attracted one to another. And when we are attracted one to another, there are certain things that we wind up eventually doing with one another that will cause a seed to enter into the womb of the woman and she bears children. That's the fruit. Okay, That's not the reason that men and women marry each other. It is the fruit of the reason that they marry each other. Okay, Because if somebody wants children, they can adopt children. Okay? And I know it's not the same thing as having your own children. I'm just making an example. You don't, a man doesn't marry a woman so that she can bear him children. A man marries a woman because he loves her, he's attracted to her, and he has sexual desires that needs to be met, and so does she, and so they come together in the covenant of marriage. And in the act of, or in the process of enjoying the pleasures of that God has ordained within the covenant of marriage, children come forth. That's just the natural consequence. Pardon me if you will, of the sexual intimacy between a man and his wife. All right. Now, I know that we're all grown-ups here, but I felt it was necessary to explain these things, although we already, you know, hopefully you already understand these things, but it was necessary to reiterate those things to, to kind of lay a foundation. The reason that men and women marry one another is to avoid fornication. It is because we have a desire in ourselves for sexual intimacy. That's the reason. Okay.
Now let's go on in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Due benevolence. Well, if there's anybody that doesn't really know what that means, it, what it means is the, the, the duty of marriage, as it's called in the law. It means whatever your husband or wife needs sexually, intimately, it is your duty to provide that. And it's not just your duty, like as if it were a grievous thing. It is a privilege for you to provide that. Now let me explain something to you. Sexual intimacy, the word intimacy, the very definition of the word intimacy, relates to us something that is hidden from the world, something that is very private. Um, and intimacy should be, your intimacy with your spouse should be you and him or her exposing to one another voluntarily, willingly, not only the most intimate parts of your body, but the most intimate parts of your mind and your soul. Whatever things you have in your heart or in your soul that you desire to explore or to do in an intimate fashion with your spouse, you should be able to sit down in, in a room alone with him or her and explain these things and have intimate conversations where, where you can share the deepest desires of your heart, the secret things that you have never told anybody before, knowing that the person that you're with is going to listen to you and enjoy hearing what you have to say and is going to enjoy discovering those things with you. That's part of a marriage. That's part of a marriage. In fact, that's 90% of a marriage. It's not just a little part. That's 90% of a marriage. That's the, the vast majority of the reason why you got married in the first place. Like I said, if you just wanted somebody to cook your meals and wash your clothes, you could hire somebody to do that. Okay, What you need is more than somebody to cook your meals and wash your clothes. You need a wife, someone you can share intimacy with. And if you're a woman, you you know you just you don't just need somebody to, to to pay your bills and stuff like that. You know you need somebody. You need a man who loves you and who you can share your intimate desires with, who you can unleash the secrets of your heart onto and and without fear, knowing that he's not going to laugh at you, that he's not going to say, well, that's gross or that's disgusting or anything like that. He's going to say, wow, I'm glad you shared that with me. Let's try that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I'm not going to get into, you know, intimate details in this video, in a public video, but I'm, I'm, I trust that I'm giving you enough information so that you can understand what I'm talking about. There should be nothing hidden in your heart. If you're a married person, whether you're a man or a woman, there should be nothing, nothing hidden in your heart that you are ashamed or embarrassed or afraid to share with your spouse. Nothing. If there is, then there's another level that you need to come to in your marriage. You need to come to it. You need to come to it yourself. You need to conquer it yourself. And then you need to come to your spouse and say, I've conquered something. I've come to a level where I want to be honest with you about things that I've never told anybody in my life. And I trust you not to laugh at me, not to think that it's stupid, or not to, not to get mad at me, but to honor my, my, my desires and to, and to see that they are my desires so that I can share them with you. That's the way it should be. In fact, not, that's not the way it should be. That's the way it must be, because if it's not like that, your marriage will fail. Your marriage will fail. Period. If your sexual intimacy with your spouse is not sufficient, if it is not satisfying, your marriage will fail. That's the reason that you're married. And so, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Husbands, this means that when your wife gets up the courage to tell you something, a secret of her heart, you do not answer her like this. <laughs> yeah, right, like we're really going to do that. You do not answer her like this. Um, that's gross. No, you do not answer her like that. You answer her like this. Wow. That took a lot of courage to share that with me, and I'm glad you did. And I'd like to try the, that with you or those things with you. And the same thing with your wife and your husband. And, you know, it's a lot more difficult for a man to come forth and be honest about the things that he wants from you intimately. It's a lot more difficult for a man than it is for a woman because of the emotional makeup of men and women. 
um, men have a wall of pride that they have to deal with, and they it's very difficult for a man to be open with his wife about things that she might because for a man rejection any for anybody but especially for a man rejection is the ultimate shutdown rejection and especially to be rejected by your own wife is the ultimate shutdown it's like you know if a man is is honest with his wife and he says you know i this is what i would really like to do with you and the wife says oh no i'm not doing that that's gross no i'm not doing that you have just thrown a giant wall between you and your spouse and your marriage will fail your marriage will fail you have just cast down a huge boulder from from heaven right between you and him <laughs> and your intimacy will never be the same again unless you fix that situation and when you're a woman and your husband says I'd like to do this or I'd like to do that your your answer to him is yes sir that would be awesome yes sir when can we try that I may not be very good at it I've never done that before but if you'll be patient with me and teach me, I'll be happy to learn. Because my main, my, 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 my desire is to please you. You are my Lord. You're my master. And whatever you want, that's what I'm going to do to please you. Praise the Lord. That's what he needs. Your husband needs to know that when he asks you something, or even when he tells you something, that you are going to say, yes, sir, and you're going to do it. And if you give him any other response, like, no, I'm not going to do that, or, or no, that's gross, or whatever, you have just cast a huge boulder from heaven right in between the midst of you, and, and you have ruined your sexual intimacy. You have, And you have done that because of, of the way that a man is in his emotions. And once he is rejected, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of explanation, a lot of time, and a lot of emotional healing for him to get over that rejection, especially if he's rejected by his own wife. If a man has been rejected by his own wife, and you say, no, I'm not going to do that or whatever. This is what happens in the man. This is what happens in his heart. Okay, she doesn't want to do that, so I'm not ever going to ask her again. Boy, I'm sure, I'm sure sorry that I even asked her that. I'm never going to bring that up again, and I'm not going to be satisfied in our sexual intimacy, and I'm just going to try the best that I can not to you know, lust after other women, even though, boy, I sure wish I had a woman who would do this with me, or I sure had, wish I had a woman, I sure wish I had, I sure wish I had. If you are causing your husband to say, I sure wish I had, then your marriage will fail because you are married to one another because of your need for sexual intimacy other than the fact totally apart from the fact that you two are best friends and that you do the things for him that you ought to do for him as his wife and he does the things for you that he ought to do as your husband for you those things are 10 percent of your relationship the other 90 percent of your relationship at least 90 percent of your relationship is the sexual intimacy and if your husband has been shut down by you and you've told him he has he's gotten up the courage to tell you what he wants from you and you have told him no in any way shape or form you have told him with your body language or with your mouth that you are not going to do that you have shut it you have shut him down and you have thrown up a wall between him and you and now if there's any sexual intimacy between you two at all it's going to be fake it's going to be fake he's going to be faking it and you're going to be faking it because there's that big, huge elephant in the room. Have you ever heard that saying, the big elephant in the room? That nobody wants to talk about? It's obvious. It's right there, but nobody wants to talk about it. That's what's going to be going on. That's unacceptable in a marriage. Okay? So let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and also the wife unto the husband. This is a commandment from God. 1 Corinthians 7.3 Okay, wives and husbands. This is a commandment from God. It is not negotiable. It is not something that you get to decide whether or not you're going to do. You must do it. If you, if you want to serve God, if you want to please God and you want to please your husband or your wife, then this is what you are going to do. And it shouldn't be a grievous thing to you. If it is a grievous thing to you, then there's other serious problems in your marriage that need to be addressed. But if the person that you're married to desires to, to do certain things with you and, and you don't desire to do those things with him, then there's a problem with your, with your relationship, with your trust, with your love one for another. And those things need to be looked at as well. And that's not the subject of this video, so I'm going to leave that as it is. But um, 
Having said that, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Okay? Now, wives, if your husband tells you, I bought this outfit for you today, I want you to go put it on, your response to him is, yes, sir, I'll be right out. I'll be ready in 10 minutes or 5 minutes or whatever. That's what your response should be. When you're in your house, whatever your husband wants to dress you in is his business. And he's able to do that. He has the right to do that. Okay. Now, if you're out on the street and your husband wants you wants to dress you up like you know like a like a topless dancer or something on the street, um, you know that's out of the question because you have you had better obey God first and your husband second. Um, and it's not definitely not the will of God for you to go out in public dressed like a topless dancer. However, if you're in your house and your husband wants to dress you up like a topless dancer or like a circus clown or like a pony or whatever you might want to do in your house, okay, that is your right to do so. That's your husband's right to, to tell you to put that on if he wants you to. And it is for you to say, yes, sir, and do it in a way that is pleasing to him, not in a grievous way, not in a grudging way. Not, well, okay, if you're going to make me, that ruins it. That ruins it. My sister, your husband needs you to be that help meet for him, that suitable servant for him. Your husband needs to have a submissive wife who is going to listen to his desires and the desire of her heart is to please him and whatever his desire is, that's what she's going to do. In other words, your wish is my command. That is the sexiest, most attractive, most beautiful thing that a woman can be to her husband. That, that a man can ever hear, your wish is my desire. And if you will be that to your husband all the time, your intimacy will be like a flame of fire. <laughs> I guarantee you, that is what your man needs. And I can say this as a man. If you're a woman, okay, this is what your husband needs. If you're a man, what your woman needs, what your wife needs, is to know that she can trust you, is to know that she's secure with you, is to know that you're not going to tell anybody else the things that she tells you in the secret of your, in the privacy of your bedroom. And that you're going to respect her, not laugh at her when she shares with you her, her, her desires, but that you're going to desire to please her as well. Because, you know, she's just, it's not a one-way street. She's just not there to please you and you're, you're, the, you're the ogre and you just get to do whatever you want, step all over her feelings. It is your responsibility to please her as well. You know, just like our Lord Jesus Christ, we have this relationship with him. We are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And the desire of our heart is to please him. That's the desire of our heart. When we know that he's pleased with us, that's our joy. But at the same time, it gives him pleasure to please us as well. When we are happy and joyful, that gives him pleasure. And when we are sad then that gives him displeasure. That causes him to want to attend to us, to cause our sadness to, to go away so that he can wipe our tears away. That's what he desires to do. And so that's what you should be to your wife also, husband. If you expect her to submit herself to you, then you need to give her that comfort and security that she needs in order to submit herself to you. And I've spoken about this more in other videos, like uh, there's a video called Right Relationships Between Men and Women on this channel. And that goes into more about the role of the husband as the head and the wife as his servant and, and, and being um, subject unto him. And as the scripture says, let the, let the wives be subject to their husbands in everything, even as Christ is, or even as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. That's the scripture. Okay. But just because your wife is subject unto you, and you expect her to be subject unto you, that doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want. You also have a responsibility to be to her as our Lord is to us. And so having said that, I don't want to get off on that route right there right now because that's a different subject. So let's continue on. Verse 4. We're in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. What is it saying? Well, it's saying just what it says. And it's also saying the same thing that Paul just said in verse 3. And the reason that he said this again in a different way is to reiterate it and to, to underline it and to highlight it so that we would have no question about what he is telling us to do. 
we are in a marriage relationship. I'm married myself. I have a beautiful, lovely wife that is my gift from God that she dropped from, from heaven into my lap. It's amazing she didn't break my legs from falling out, out of heaven onto me. But uh, she is my blessing from heaven. I love her dearly. And, and she feels the same way about me. Praise the Lord. And this is how it ought to be in a relationship. And I've explained to her these very same things that I'm explaining to you. Okay, if you're a husband and you're a Christian, then you will probably need to sit down and explain these things to your wife as well. You know, in a, you know, in a, in, not in a setting of you're in bed together in your intimacy, in a different setting, like in your living room where you're both dressed and you're opening the Bible to study the Word of God. And, and you might say to her, you know, my love, I have something that, that I need to share with you from the Word of God. And she says, yes, sir. And, you know, if she's doing anything that... that you know, can't wait, she needs to finish that up or whatever, and then she can meet you in the living room, and you can sit down, open the Bible, pray together, and then you can share these things with her so that she understands these things as well. Uh, or maybe you're both sitting in the living room right now watching this video so that I can share these things with both of you at the same time, and that's a wonderful blessing. Praise the Lord. So, the wife hath not power of her own body but the husband. This is the same thing as uh, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. That's saying the same thing, the exact same thing. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. Okay, what does this mean? It means what it says. If you're a woman, and, you're, and you are in a marriage covenant with a man, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. You gave yourself to him in a covenant of marriage and became one flesh with him because you love him and you trust him. And therefore, your body is his to use however he desires to use it. Period. End of story. You do not have the right to tell him no in anything. Okay? Now, of course, you know, this is excluding, you know, crimes. You know, if he wants to tie you upside down on a flagpole outside and beat you with a bullwhip, of course, I mean, that would be, you know, you can say, um, no, that's, you know, that's, that's injuring someone, that's you know, causing injury to someone, that's assaulting someone, okay? But, and that's a, kind of a ridiculous example, but I just did that because I'm not going to get into sexual intimacy details with you. I'm just going to let you know that assaulting someone or injuring someone is not the will of God, and that's not pleasing before God. At the same time, whatever it is that your husband, if you're a woman of God, whatever it is that your husband wants to use your body for, that's his right to do so, and it is not your right to tell him no. Period. End of story. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if maybe you don't even like that. Do it, because that is your duty. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and also the wife unto the husband. The, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. Okay? The only time that any part of your body should be withholden from your husband is when you are during the time of your separation, when you are having your menstrual cycle. And of course, when you're having your menstrual cycle, there should be no um, intimacy re um, in involving that part of your anatomy. Okay? It's not to say that there shouldn't be any intimacy. There can be lots of intimacy, just not touching that particular part of your anatomy. Okay? That's the only reason that you should ever be inclined to tell your husband that, you, he, that he's not allowed to use a certain part of your body. Um, and God does not want a husband to discover the fountain of her. His, his wife's menstrual blood either. Okay, that's not a clean thing. That's not something that we should do. So, but there are products that you can use to stop that, and then you can do other things. There's there's plenty of other forms of int intimacy that you can have other than, I won't get into detail. You know what I'm talking about. So, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And, likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So, if you are a wife, and you desire to touch or do certain things with your husband's body, his body is yours. And, and husband, it doesn't pertain to you to tell her, no, I don't feel like it right now. You know, or I'm busy right now. Okay, well, maybe you are busy and maybe you have things to do and that's understandable. So maybe you need her to wait a few minutes until you finish up with what you need to do. But then you need to give her what she's asked you for. Because if you shut her down, you've rejected your own wife. She's been rejected by her own husband. And that's a terrible thing. That's a terrible thing psychologically, emotionally, and also sexually. And so we don't do that to one another. We don't do that to one another. Okay? When we love one another and one of us wants something from the other, we give it. And also, when we love one another, if we want something from our partner, 
but we can see that our partner is not feeling well or that it's just not the right time, then we can have respect for that person out of love and wait for another time. Okay, just because our partner is bound to give us what belongs to us, that doesn't mean that we should demand it when we see that it's not a good time to do so. It's a two-way street. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 5, defraud ye not one the other. Defraud. What does it mean to defraud, boys and girls? It's perfectly simple. To defraud somebody means to not give them something that you owe them. That's what it means to defraud. You know, if, if you have a store and I come into your store and I say, I'd like to buy that, um, that oven. Okay, well, the oven is $300. I think I live in the 60s. Ovens aren't $300 anymore. But anyway, you know, the oven is $300. Okay, I'll pay you on Friday. I want, I want it on credit. I'll pay you on Friday. I'll give you $20 now on the other $280 on Friday. Okay, and then I take the oven to my house and then I never pay you. I've defrauded you. That's a crime. That's against the law. Because I've not given you that which I promised to give you, that which I owe you. You see, it's not just a, a favor that I give you that money. It, it is owed to you. It belongs to you, and I'm keeping it from you. That's what it means to defraud. So Paul says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, which means that both of you agree for a specific time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, this is what something else that I want to talk to you about. Incontinency. What does the word incontinent mean? Well, perhaps some of you have heard the word incontinent in the context of older people who don't have control of their bodily functions anymore, and they have to go back to wearing diapers like they did when they were a baby. If you're one of those people, please don't be offended at that. I didn't mean it to, to you know, crack a joke or, or, or poke fun at you. But there are some people, when, when they get older, they, they don't have the same control over their bodily functions anymore, and they tend to urinate before they can get to the bathroom, and so they have to wear diapers, just like a little baby does. Uh, and that's because of incontinency. The, 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 the fact that someone doesn't have control over themselves and they do things when they don't want to or, or it's not the proper place, is that's called incontinency. And Paul used that particular word, although it's he wrote it in Greek, but we have it in English. It's incontinency. It means that you are so weak that if you don't have an outlet to take out the, 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 the desire and need that you have, that you'll wind up taking it out somewhere else that you shouldn't. Just like a person who is incontinent regarding the, the, the functions of his body, if he's not near a place to urinate, if he's not like three feet from it, then he's not going to make it and he's going to wind up soiling his clothes because that's incontinency. And so it is with us. Okay, We are men and women. We are humans. Our members are filled with lust. And that's why God has ordained marriage between a man and a woman, to avoid fornication. And so if we, are, if we are not giving to our wife or our husband that which we have need of, then or that which they have need of, I should say, then we are going to cause them to stumble. We're going to cause them to be tricked by, not tricked, but tempted by Satan because of their incontinency. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Now, maybe you're a woman and you're what, People refer to as frigid. Maybe you're a woman and you just don't like sex. You just don't like sexual intimacy. If that's the case, I'm sorry to say this, but why did you marry? Okay? If you're a woman and you don't like sexual intimacy, then you shouldn't have married. But you are in a marriage now, if you're married. And your duty is to do the things that your husband desires to do with you. Your body belongs to him, and he has the right to use your body however he sees fit. As long as he's not committing a crime, as long as he's not injuring you or killing you, okay? Because murder is a crime; thou shalt not kill, all right? And also, for you know, for for a man to commit violence against a person is is wrong. You know, we should render no man evil for evil. We have no business hitting people um, and committing uh, injurious acts against people. Other than that, whatever your husband wants to do with you, it is his right to do so, and it is your duty to tell him yes, sir, and to tell him yes, sir, with a smile. And do it lovingly. All right. And if you're a man, if you're a man and you're not attracted to your wife, 
You don't, and you can't tell her this, okay, but you're not attracted to her anymore for various reasons. This is what you need to do, my brother. You need to pray about these things, and then you need to talk to her about these things. You need to pray about this and get it straight in your heart, and then you need to talk to her and tell her. If you're not attracted to her anymore, you need to tell her that, and you need to tell her why. Don't tell her, I'm just not attracted to you anymore, and then don't say anything else. If you're going to tell her that you're not attracted to her anymore, you have to also give her the solution so that she can become attractive to you again. You can't tell her, I'm not attracted to you anymore, without giving her the way to become attractive to you again. You can't. You must have both of those things together. If you're going to tell your wife, I'm not attracted to you anymore, maybe it's because of the way she acts. Maybe it's because of the way she dresses. Maybe it's because of the way she smells. Okay? Smell is a very important thing for those of us who are married. Okay? If maybe you would like her to wear a certain perfume or not wear a certain perfume. Maybe she doesn't understand personal hygiene the way that she should. And if she doesn't, then you'll have to teach her those things. Okay? Maybe, you know, maybe you just don't like jewelry or whatever. Maybe, you know, whatever it is about her. Maybe if there's something about her that, that, that causes her to be unattractive to you now, you need to explain to her because you married her and she was attractive to you when you married her. So whatever the problem is, if you're not attracted to her anymore, that can be fixed. Because she's the same person that she was when you married her. It's just that certain things about her have changed so that she's become unattractive to you. So those things that have changed to make her unattractive to you can be changed to make her attractive to you again. But you have to understand that she needs you to explain that to her. Okay? You need to give unto your wife due benevolence. And wives, you need to give unto your husbands due benevolence. You must be able to trust in your spouse. And your spouse must be able to trust in you to share with you the intimate desires of his or her heart. And to do those things with them. That is 90% plus of a marriage. If you don't have that in your marriage, then your marriage is going to fail. In fact, your marriage has failed already if you don't have those things in your marriage. And if you don't have those things in your marriage and your marriage has failed already, that doesn't mean you should give up on it. That means you should do what you can do to fix it because it can be fixed. Because when on the day that you and your spouse stood together before God and took one another to be husband and wife, you loved one another and you were attracted to one another. And that person is still the same person. So if there's things about him or her that have changed since that day that have disappointed you, then you need to lovingly and respectfully talk to that person about it and give and offer that person a solution so that they he or she can change those things and become more attractive. Maybe that person has gained a lot of weight. You need to talk to that person and let him know or let her know. You know, I need you to do, this is what I need as your wife or as your husband. I need for you to love me enough to care for your health and to, and to keep yourself healthy for my sake and to keep yourself attractive to me for my, for, for my sake. Now, I have that responsibility for my wife and she has that responsibility for me as well. And, and, and you do as well. Okay, you have the responsibility to, to cause yourself to be physically fit and attractive and clean at all times with your teeth brushed so that your breath doesn't, you know, knock over camels. <laughs> and, you know, women, when you, when you walk around in your house, you don't just get up out of your bed without brushing your hair, without brushing your teeth and start running around the house. You know, you get up, you brush your hair, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, then you have some time in prayer, some time in the Word, and then you serve your husband. And when, you're, when you present yourself to your husband, you're not dressed in a house coat with your hair in a bun and slippers on. You're, you're, you have made yourself attractive to him. Just like when you first were going out with him and you, and you made yourself attractive for him, to, for him to take you out to dinner. You didn't, you know, he didn't, when you were getting ready for him to take you out to dinner, you just didn't roll out of bed, put your hair up in a bun, put your slippers on, say, hi, I'm ready. Of course not. That's ridiculous. You, you made yourself pretty for him. And that's what you need to do every day. That's what he needs you to do every day. And not just women, that's men. That's what your wife needs you to do every day as well. You know, your wife doesn't want to see you laying around the house with a big fat belly and a beer in your hand and shorts on and, you know, scratching your body parts and watching football and belching. That Your wife doesn't want to see that. You see, your wife needs to see you the way that you were when she fell in love with you. You see, she needs that man. 
So I, I believe I've talked enough about that. We have a responsibility one to another, not only to, 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 uh, to render unto the other due benevolence, but also to keep ourselves attractive to the other, to remember and have respect and love for the person that we love and cause ourselves to be presentable to them in as much as possible the same way that we were when we were when we first got married. Now I understand that everybody gets older, that's a reality, but we can still do what we can to to keep ourselves fit and healthy and attractive. Okay? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So incontinency, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, incontinency. Wow, I've been speaking for a long time and I still have several things to get to. I wasn't really intending to speak this long, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, perhaps this will be a great study for married couples just to sit down and watch for an hour or so on, you know, in their living room with their Bibles open. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. This is a commandment from God. Again, okay, this is a commandment from God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for what, boys and girls? Instruction in righteousness. This is instruction in righteousness. If you're righteous, if you're a child of the living God, and you desire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, then if you're a woman, you should be serving your husband according to this word, without question, with all readiness of mind. And if you're a husband, you should also should be, should be loving your wife and giving her the things that she has need of according to this word, without questioning God, and with joy doing these things for her. This is righteousness. This is righteousness. And so he says, And come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. The only reason that you and your wife should not be having intimacy together is for a specific period of time that you both agree on for the purpose of fasting and prayer. You say to your wife, I think we need to fast and pray. I feel I need to fast and pray. She says, Amen. Okay, I'll, I'll be fasting with you. And you agree, we're going to fast for three days, or we're going to fast for five days, or whatever, and or for one day, or whatever it is. And then after that, then you come together again. After you break your fast, you have something to eat, you pray together, worship the Lord together, then you come together again. And when come together means that you come together in sexual intimacy again. And this is for a very specific reason, so that Satan doesn't tempt you for your incontinency, because you need sexual intimacy. And if you're not getting it from your spouse, then Satan is going to tempt you to try to go get it somewhere else. And you may or may not give in to that temptation, but whether you do or whether you don't, it's still not a nice thing to have to live with. And it will hinder you in your walk with the Lord. Wives, if you have a Christian husband and he is serving the Lord Jesus Christ, he has taken you to wife to provide for him those things that he has need of. And when you provide for him those things that he has need of, then he will be a stronger servant in the Lord. And if you're not providing him those things that he has need of in the way that he wants you to, with joy, as his servant, then you are hindering his walk with the Lord. You're making his walk with the Lord difficult. It is as though he's walking on a narrow bridge and you're there on the ground with a pole poking him while he's trying to walk across this narrow bridge. How is he supposed to walk across that narrow bridge with you molesting him like that? But if you are serving him, if you are loving him, if you are giving him that which he has need of joyfully, and your joy is seeing that your husband is pleased with you, then he's walking across that narrow bridge with sure footsteps. And you can look at your man, your knight in shining armor, walking across that narrow bridge over that gorge with sure footsteps and confidence. And you can say, that's my, that's my man, that's my prince, that's my, that's my knight in shining armor. That's him there. I belong to him. Hallelujah. That's the way it should be. And if you don't do that, then you're going to cause Satan to tempt him for his incontinency. And this doesn't just go for men. It goes for women as well. Because women can be incontinent as well. Women have sexual needs as well. And there are many women who have, you know, having not gotten those needs met from their husband, will seek other men to get them from. I'm not saying that that's right or good. I'm saying that it's natural and, that, and that's what happens. 
There's no excuse for it. It's called adultery, but that's what happens when people aren't getting the sexual intimacy that they need in their marriage. And this is why Paul wrote these things. Paul, the apostle of Christ, yes, the apostle of Jesus Christ, is writing things concerning the intimacy between a man and his wife and telling us that we have the responsibility before God to provide these things one for another. This is part of the scripture. It is part of life as a Christian. It is part of a marriage relationship between a godly man and a godly woman. Praise the Lord. Let's look at something else. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. I know that there are many of you who are thinking about this verse when you clicked on this video, so I'm going to take you there. I'd like to read you something that I have on my screen right now. It's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, but it's in a false Bible that is called the New International Version. The New, For those of you who don't know, the New International Version of the Bible is not the Word of God. It is an evil satanic book that contains parts of the Word of God, but uh, a great portion of it has been changed in order to change around the doctrine of Christ and deceive people into the pit of hell. That's what the New International Version is. It is a copyrighted novel, novel um, that was written by and is owned by a group of ungodly people, uh, some of whom are Satanists, some of them are Sodomites, and others of them are just lost, confused theologians. None of the people that were involved in the writing of the New International Version were Christians. None of them know who Jesus Christ is, and none of them has ever obeyed the gospel of Christ. Um, these people are wicked, ungodly people, and this book belongs to them. Okay, And the New International Version, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, says this, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. That, my brothers and sisters, is a complete and absolute lie. It is a lie. It's not what the Word of God says. It's not what the writer of Hebrews wrote. It's a complete and total lie, and it is a very dangerous lie, and I'm going to explain to you why. Let me read it again. It says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. This makes me angry. It's such a satanic lie. Let's look in the Holy Bible, King James Version. Okay, If you speak English, the Holy Bible is the King James Version of the Holy Scriptures. Hebrews 13.4 Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. That's God's Word. That's what the writer of Hebrews wrote. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now I have Hebrews 13.4 in the New, Ash New International Version in front of me because it's part of the letter that one of the two people that wrote to me, wrote to me today, and she was asking me about this. And I let her know in an email that the New International Version is not the Word of God in English, and that I would explain more about this in the video, so here it is. First of all, we know that any holy Bible, that's, well, any Bible that says Holy Bible on the front, but it has a copyright on the text, is not the Holy Bible. It's not the Word of God, because no one can put a copyright on the text of the Scripture. And whenever you open up a Bible and you see the, the, a little copyright and you say no portion of this Scripture may be reproduced or used in any certain fashion without written permission from the publisher or something like that, uh, you know that the Bible that you're reading is not God's Word. Because no man owns God, God's word, and no man has the right to ask you to, to ask him permission or to pay him for permission to use any portion of the scripture in any teaching or anything that you want to share it with, or any any place that you want to share it. Okay, the fact that a man is asking you to do that and claiming that he has ownership over that means that it is a copyrighted novel. It is not God's word. The Holy Bible King James Version is the Word of God. There is no copyright on the text of the Holy Bible, King James Version. Now you may say, well, Brother Clinton, I have a KJV Bible, and there's a copyright right here on the front page. Okay, the copyright is a copyright on things in the Bible like study helps, or column reference columns, or things like that, that are added to the Scripture by the publisher of the Bible. Okay, glossaries, concordances, study helps, commentaries, those things are sometimes in a King James Bible. And those things, if you see a copyright, the, the copyright is concerning those things. The copyright is not 
concerning the text of the scripture. And there is nothing in your KGV Bible that says that you have to have anybody's permission to share any amount of the scripture in that Bible that you want with anyone anywhere, because the text of the Holy Bible is not copyrighted. It cannot be copyrighted. It is God's word. That's the difference. And, and there, that's just one difference between these Bibles, but it is one that is so prominent that should cause you to, to understand immediately just by that fact that when you see a Bible that says Holy Bible on the front, but the text of that Bible is copyrighted and owned by a man or a group of men, you know that it cannot be the Word of God. You should know that. Having said that, I want to move on. Hebrews 13.4 in this New International Version, Satanic Bible, it says, Marriage should be honored by all. Is that what the Bible says? No. No. The Bible does not say marriage should be honored by all. That's not written in the Holy Bible anywhere. And the writer of Hebrews does not say marriage should be honored by all. He said marriage is honorable in all. Marriage should be honored by all. Marriage is honorable in all. Those two sentences do not say the same thing at all. Okay? The Bible doesn't say marriage should be honored by all. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all. This means that when you are married, you're a man and you're married to a woman, that whatever you do with your wife, as long as you're not breaking the law by killing her or injuring her, right? Whatever you want to do with your wife is honorable. Marriage is honorable in all, which means anything that you share with your spouse is honorable. You are flesh of his or her flesh, bone of his or her bones. You can share any intimate thing that you want, whether it be a thought, a word, or a sexual act with your husband or your wife, and it is honorable. In all, marriage is honorable in all. Okay, I can't stress this enough. It doesn't say marriage should be honored by all, and that's a lie of the New International Version. And why is the New International Version lying to you about this? So that Satan will tempt you for your incontinency. So that the, the, new, the new International Version of the Bible can be used to teach you that you as a wife have the, have the right to refuse to do something with your husband because you just don't like to do it or because you, maybe you think it's, it's dirty or whatever. Okay, but the Holy Bible doesn't teach that. The Holy Bible tells you to render unto one another due benevolence and that marriage is honorable in all. But the New International Version just totally cut that sentence out and, and said marriage should be honored by all, which has nothing to do with what was written here. The phrase marriage should be honored by all, that has nothing to do with what was written here in Hebrews 13.4. Nothing at all. It's completely changing the subject to something else that has nothing to do with it. You see that? The Bible says marriage is honorable in all. Okay? And, 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 and the Hebrews 13.4 in the New International Version goes on to say, and the marriage bed kept pure. Another lie. Another lie. Because the Holy Bible says, and the bed undefiled. If you're married, the Bible says your marriage bed is undefiled. It doesn't say that you need to keep your marriage bed pure. It says your marriage bed is undefiled. But by saying you should keep your marriage bed pure, that is being used to teach you that there are certain things that you should and certain things that you shouldn't do in your marriage bed with your spouse. And that is a lie, and the Bible teaches no such thing. There is nothing, there is not one word of the Scripture from Genesis to Revelation that tells a husband or a wife that there is anything that they are not allowed to do in their marriage bed. There's nothing. There's not one word of the Scripture ever that specifies any sexual act, any act of intimacy that is forbidden between a man and his wife. Nothing. <coughs> Pardon me. So the New International Version is a lie. And it says marriage should be honored by all, instead of telling the truth that marriage is honorable in all. And then it says, and the marriage bed kept pure. Instead of saying, and the bed undefiled. Your marriage bed is undefiled. Whatever you want to do, whatever desires you have in your heart as a spouse, and you want to do with your spouse, 
in your marriage, in your bed, is perfect and holy before God. You are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, and you can do whatever you want to do. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of being married. That's the whole point that God took woman out of man, made her beautiful, brought her back to the man, and he loved her, and he said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Brothers and sisters, that's the whole point. And if you are allowing people to teach you that there are, or if you're allowing your even uh, devils to whisper in your ear, or your conscience to teach you that there are certain things that you shouldn't do with your husband or your wife, you are being deceived, and you are being deceived on purpose to, in order to cause your husband or your wife to go seek somewhere else that which they are not getting from you. And when that happens, then guess what? That's the doctrine of Balaam, brothers and sisters. The doctrine of Balaam is a military strategy that Satan uses when you are in Christ and he can't take you out of, he can't come up to you and just grab you and take you out of Jesus Christ's hand. Because Jesus Christ said, no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. But if he can get you to walk away, like Balaam did in giving counsel to Balak in the, in, in the 22nd chapter of Numbers, and it's also in the 25th chapter, you have to search the scriptures to find it. But Jesus spoke of the doctrine of Balaam. And it is it, this, the strategy that Balaam used in the book of Numbers was when, when the people of Israel were gathered together and they were strong and they were mighty and the king of Moab saw that they were they, they were treading through the land, licking up the, 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 the nations like an ox licks up grass. They were conquering all the nations and Moab saw, the king of Moab saw, Balak it was his name, he saw that they were coming towards his kingdom. And he tried, he called for Balak, Balaam who was a seer and he, he, he paid Balaam to curse the people of Israel. And Balaam said, well, I'll give it my best, but I'm going to tell you right now, I, I can't curse what God has blessed. And Balaam could not curse the people of Israel. But Balaam did something before he left that caused Balak to be able to defeat the people of Israel. What was it? He gave him counsel. This is called the counsel of Balaam. He gave him counsel, and through the counsel of Balaam, the king of Moab introduced the women of Moab into the tribes of the children of Israel. And guess what, boys and girls? The people of Israel were commanded not to take the women of Moab for wives and not to give their daughters to the men of Moab as wives, not to covenant with them in marriage, but they did. And it didn't happen in just a moment. You can read about it in like one little paragraph in the Bible, but it didn't happen in one minute like you could read about it. It happened over a period of time, slowly, slowly. And the women of Moab were introduced into the tribes of Israel and at first they said, oh, no, 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 we can't marry you. But then, well, maybe just, you know, maybe just one. And they're really nice people and they believe in our God. And, you know, what, and, and whatever else might have happened. And, and they introduced, the king of Moab introduced his women into the people of Israel. And they married the women of Moab. And they gave their sons, or their daughters unto their sons. And then they weren't under the shadow of the Almighty anymore. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Through subtlety, Satan saw that he could not defeat the people of Israel. So through subtlety, he introduced something into their tribes that would cause them to come out from the protection of the Almighty God so that they would be vulnerable. That's the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam concerning you and your marriage with your husband or your wife is to try to rob you of the sexual intimacy that you know that you need and to cause you to be so frustrated with your spouse that you will turn to other things or other people that you shouldn't be turning to. And when that happens, then guess what? You're in adultery. And if you're in adultery, then you are no longer a testimony for Jesus Christ as long as you remain in that adultery. And then you're not a threat to Satan anymore. You're not a threat to Satan if you're living in your sin, Christian. But if you're living and walking in righteousness, then the power of God is upon you. And then you have power to cast out devils in Jesus' name and heal the sick in Jesus' name and preach the gospel without hindrance, without, without, any, without any, any, any shame, without any hesitation. That's the word I was looking for. Because you have firmly upon you your, blessed, your breastplate of righteousness. 
and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you are bold as a lion because you're not in sin, because you have fulfilled for you everything that you have need of in your intimate relationship with your spouse, which is why God gave her to you. That's the whole reason. That's the whole point. If you are allowing your enemy to deceive you into thinking that there are certain things that you shouldn't do or are not allowed to do with your spouse, then you are, you are giving yourself over to frustration that is going to cause you to be frustrated in your relationship with your spouse and it's going to cause you to desire things elsewhere because your spouse isn't giving them to you. Whether or not you fulfill that, that might happen or it might not. Some of you might be strong enough to never actually sin and, and commit the sin of adultery, but still, you're living in frustration because there are certain things in your heart that you desire with your spouse that you're not getting, either because you haven't shared it with your spouse because you're afraid to, ashamed to, or embarrassed to, or because your spouse has just shut you down and said, no, I'm not going to do that. That's wrong, my brothers and sisters. That is wrong. <coughs> Pardon me. Let's go back to Hebrews 13.4. I'm going to read it in this New International Satanic Version again. It says, marriage should be honored by all. That's a lie. Okay, it's, it may be true. Marriage should be honored by all. Okay, that's something that I can't really argue with that. That's a true statement, but it's not what the Bible says. And it is not what the Bible says on purpose. Because the New International Version, the writers there, didn't want you to know that the Bible says marriage is honorable in all. It is honorable in all. There is nothing that is forbidden for you to do with your wife or with your husband in the privacy of your own marriage bed. Whatever you do, I'm not going to go into you know, all the details of things that you could do with your wife and your husband. You can imagine those things, okay? But there is nothing. I'm, t I'm telling you. I don't have to tell you everything you're allowed to do because there is nothing that you're not allowed to do. So you don't need a list of all the things that you're allowed to do. All you have to do is search your heart you know, and, and let your imagination go wild and do whatever you want to do with your spouse. Because there is nothing that is forbidden you to do with your spouse. The only thing is, as I mentioned, that it is not the proper thing for a man to discover the fountain of his wife's menstrual blood. Other than that, there is nothing that you're forbidden to do. And even if you do that, if you're, it's, you know, I shouldn't say this, but even, even if you do that, it can't defile you in the same way that it defiled you, you know, during the Old Testament, although it is not clean. That, that blood is not clean and it's meant to be um, disposed of. And so... Um, because it carries uncleanness. That's why it's leaving her body. So that shouldn't be touched or, or discovered. Other than that, there is nothing that is forbidden for a man and his wife to do in their marriage bed. Nothing. Okay, if you want to swing from the ceiling, if you want to have pillow fights naked or whatever, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do in your bedroom, that's your right. And it's not just your right. It is a privilege of the covenant that you entered into. It is the whole reason that you entered into that covenant. So if you're not giving that to one another, you have been failing in your marriage, and you need to address that and do that. Okay? Marriage, this is the Holy Bible, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. This is so very important. Okay? I didn't go over other false Bible versions. There's probably a million of them. Okay? Maybe not that many, but there's probably several hundred of them in English. Um, and they probably all say different things. But if, it, if they don't say what this Bible says, then they're not the Word of God. Because the Bible says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. What does this mean? It means what it says. It means that everything that you do with your spouse in the privacy of your bedroom is honorable, and your bed is undefiled. Your bed is undefiled. It doesn't say that you need to keep your bed undefiled. It says your bed is undefiled. Why does it say your bed is undefiled? Because you are in covenant with one another. You are in a blood covenant with one another. Marriage is a blood covenant. Do you know that the life of the flesh is in the blood? That means your flesh, wife, belongs to your husband, and his flesh belongs to you. Okay? He's not just another person anymore. His flesh belongs to you. The parts of his body, they're yours. Okay, you can touch them, you can do whatever you want with them whenever you want. Okay, as long as you're in your house, of course. And, and you know, you ask him and he says, yes, dear, praise the Lord, here it is. Okay, that it, it belongs to you. It's not the body of another person. It's your body. 
And whatever you want to do, whatever part you want to touch, whatever you want to do with it, whatever he wants to do with you, okay, I don't, I, maybe I just, I could say this like a hundred times or something to try to get it through the hearts and the minds of most people. It, it's the, the bed, the marriage bed is undefiled. The Bible doesn't say that we need to keep the marriage bed undefiled. The Bible says that the marriage bed is undefiled. That means that it cannot be defiled with, by anything that you and your wife do together. The only thing that can cause your marriage bed to be defiled is if one of you commits adultery with another person. That will defile your marriage bed. But there's nothing that you can do with your spouse that will defile your marriage bed. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay, I don't need to give you a list of all the things you're allowed to do because there's nothing that you're not allowed to do. Nothing. Have I said that enough times? Praise the Lord. This is so very important. And this is... This is this is an area where so many people are being attacked and so many people are failing of the grace of God and walking in, in weakness when they could be walking in power. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the last part of the verse, uh, Hebrews 13.4 says, and I'm reading from the Holy Bible, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. This is very important. I'm going to explain to you why. A whoremonger is a man who uses prostitutes to satisfy his sexual lust. That's what a whoremonger is. Okay? A whore is a woman who charges money to have sex with people. And a whoremonger is one of her customers. Okay, A whoremonger is a man who uses prostitutes to satisfy his sexual lust. Also, a whore could be a term that is used for a woman who doesn't necessarily charge, but she is just easy and she'll have sex with anybody. She's also called a whore. Okay, and then we can see examples of this in the scripture, both naturally and spiritually. And so, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. The New International Satanic Version says, but for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Okay, I hate that term, sexual immorality, sexually immoral. It is a relative term that can mean anything to anybody, and it is not found in the Holy Scripture anywhere but it is added into the New Age Bible versions, the Satanic Bible versions, in order to take away the meaning of the, of the Scripture and cause people to, to, to be able to teach from the pulpit many, many, many different things about what they consider to be sexually immoral. The Bible doesn't say sexually immoral or sexual immorality ever. That phrase is not in the Bible. Those two words together are not found in the Bible anywhere. Anywhere. Okay? Sexual immorality could mean different things to different people. It can mean anything to anybody. But whoremonger is a definite term that means, it has a specific meaning. It means a man that will, that will pay whores to satisfy him sexually. Why does the Bible say, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge? In that same sense, he was just talking about marriage. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. Okay, praise the Lord. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Pay attention. Are you paying attention? Why does the writer of Hebrews say by the Holy Ghost, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge? Because if your bed, if your marriage is honorable and all, and, and your bed is undefiled, but you or your wife don't understand that, and you are causing one another to live in frustration because you're not giving to one another what you have need of, then because of your incontinency, you are going to be led to be a whoremonger, you're going to be led to go to a prostitute or some, some loose woman and commit adultery. Just like Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is why this is here. See, Hebrews 13.4 in the New International Version is a, is a pack of lies. It is a pack of lies. Are you listening to me? It is a lie. It's not the truth. It's worded in a specific way to cover up the truth and to cause you to forget about the truth and file into the denominational churches with these professional pastors who graduated from Jesuit seminaries to teach you, <laughs> pardon me, their various doctrines. Their various doctrines. And it is there to teach you that if you're a woman, there are certain things that you shouldn't do with your husband. Or if you're a man, there are certain things that you shouldn't do with your wife. But that's kind of ridiculous. It's just like the, the fact that people think that Romans 10.9 is the, is the way to become a Christian. And the Bible doesn't say anything like that. Well, the Bible also doesn't say 
that there is anything that a man is forbidden to do with his wife in their marriage bed. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. There is nothing that you can do with your spouse in your marriage bed that will defile it. Nothing. Nothing. Okay? You might get the sheets dirty. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Wash them. <laughs> you know, buy an extra set of sheets. Praise the Lord. Get your sheets dirty. Enjoy your spouse. Enjoy your husband. Enjoy your wife. Submit yourself to your husband, wife, and husband. Give your wife the desires of her heart. Let her know that she can tell you anything in confidence and that you're never going to laugh at her or, or, or think that that's stupid or think that that's gross or whatever. Give your husband and your wife the things that they have need of, that he or she has need of. If you're a married person, that is the foundation of your walk with Christ on this earth. If you are a married person and you are not being fulfilled in your marriage bed, then your walk with Jesus Christ is being hindered because you're being tempted, whether you're giving into that temptation or not, you are being tempted because of your incontinency. You are thinking about things that you shouldn't be thinking about. You are looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, and you are susceptible to giving into a temptation that will cause you to live in sin. And when that happens, your breastplate of righteousness falls to the ground. You have no confidence before God, and you're putting on a show. You're wearing a mask that says, oh, I'm a Christian, I go to church, but on the inside, you know that you're not getting fulfilled in your marriage, and because of your incontinency, because of the natural desires that are in you, you are thinking that you are at least thinking about and probably acting on those thoughts to get your needs met somewhere else. This is a major, major problem in the churches, a major, major problem with many people who are Christians. I hope I've explained this in enough detail. And I hope I've let you know that the New International Version and any other version of the Bible in English that is worded differently than the King James Version is not and cannot be the Word of God. And we can tell by the New International Version, comparing it with the Holy Bible, King James Version, that it doesn't say the same thing at all. And it's not on accident. It wasn't translated that way to make it easier to understand. It was translated that way on purpose by wicked men and women who are led by the devil in order to turn you away from the truth of God's word, in order to destroy the blessed intimacy that God has given you with your husband or wife and cause you to live in frustration and temptation and the sin of adultery. That's why Hebrews 13.4 was written that way in the New International Version. It was done that way on purpose. But I hope that you'll see now that the King James Bible the Holy Bible, King James Version, doesn't say that at all. It says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Well, you see, you don't have to worry about being a whoremonger or an adulterer or even being tempted by those things if you will learn how to have a right relationship with your wife or husband. If you will learn how to keep yourselves attractive to one another, keep the channel of communication wide open between you two so that there is nothing that you would feel embarrassed or hesitant to share with one another. And if you will give yourselves to one another to fulfill the intimate desires of your husband or your wife with no restrictions, because God has given you no restrictions, and if you will do those things, then your marriage will be ignited and it will be like a burning flame in a, in a, in a romantic sense, okay? Um, and, your, and, your, and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ will be strong. It will be strong and you will be a terror to your enemies. And when you are living this life, married man or married woman, when you get out of your bed and your feet touch the floor, all hell shall tremble because they'll say, he's awake. She's awake. Now he or she is going to start speaking the word of God. And he has his breastplate of righteousness on. She has her breastplate of righteousness on. And they have confidence before God. All hell will tremble the moment that you open your eyes. They might have had eight hours of respite because you were sleeping. 
Now when you open your eyes and you set your feet on the floor, hell will tremble. Because you have the name of Jesus Christ in your mouth and you have your breastplate of righteousness on. And you're not living in incontinency and adultery, whether it be by, with your eyes or with your body. You are living in righteousness. And you are satisfied with the relationship that you have with your wife or your husband. And now you can conquer in the name of Jesus Christ. And there is nothing in heaven or in earth that can come against you and prevail. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'm, I'm reminded right now, because I've spoken of this many times in this video, of what Paul wrote in the letter to the Ephesians in the sixth chapter. He said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You're saying, brother, how can you talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and sexual things at the same time? Don't you understand that Jesus Christ has a bride? And he has intimacy with his bride. Now, his intimacy with his bride is different than our intimacy with our brides. Because he is the God of heaven and we are men upon earth. But God has ordained that a man and a woman come together in the covenant of marriage and that the sexual intimacy that he has ordained would bring forth fruit. How do you think babies are born? Babies are not rented. Babies are born because men and women come together in the covenant of marriage and they have sexual intimacy with one another. They get wild and crazy with one another. They shout things that they wouldn't shout normally anywhere else and they say things to one another that they wouldn't say in front of any other person because they have a person that they can be totally and completely intimate with. And when that happens, it causes life to come forth. Babies. That's what it's all about. Read the Songs of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is a series of love songs concerning a man and his wife, and it is very intimate. And it has to do with the, the, the smell of his bride and, 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 and the taste of her and comparing her to an orchard and different beautiful, uh, desirable types of fruits. It is an intimate sexual book written by the wisest man who ever lived, who also incidentally had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he knew a little bit about the art of making love, and he wrote that book by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And it is not necessarily a book about Solomon and his wives in so much as that it is a book about Jesus Christ and his bride and his desire for her and her desire for him. And that is the whole reason that God created man and then took the woman out of the man and brought her back to the man in the covenant of marriage. This is ordained of God. The sexual intimacy that you have with your husband or your wife and anything that you can imagine in the deepest, darkest corners of your heart that you would like to do with your husband or your wife is holy and it is undefiled and it is the will of God. And if you will let it go, not, not let it go like in the sense of rejecting it, let it go in the sense of letting it come forth. That's what I should have said. If you will let it come forth between your husband and your wife and keep it right there. Okay, don't talk about it with other people. If your wife, don't talk about it with your girlfriends. If your husband, don't talk about it with your friends at work or whatever. That's not their business. It's between you and your wife. And keep it between you two. And you two have those intimate secrets that only you and she know about. That will be the foundation of your strength in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. Wily. Remember wily coyote? I just thought of that. I was thinking of this word wiles. He was wily. He was always trying to catch that roadrunner. He was trying to think of anything that he could. Well, guess what? That roadrunner was like a victorious Christian. And everything that wily coyote tried came back upon his own head, literally. Literally. <laughs> You know, I'm a grown man. I still love those cartoons. In fact, I'll probably watch one after I'm finished it with this video. But um, wild e. coyote wiles are, are trickeries that the that your enemy, the devil, is is constantly machinating against you, constantly thinking about how he can get you off of the right path, how he can weaken you, how he can crack your blessed breastplate of righteousness. Because if there's a crack in your breastplate then all it takes is the right aim to stick a sword right in it, right? But if your breastplate is on firmly, 
then a sword will not penetrate it. And you are protected by what? Your righteousness. Your righteousness. Because if our, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. But if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Do you understand how important this is, my brother, my sister? You are in a marriage so that your sexual desires can be fulfilled. Fulfill them. So that you do, what, what's the point of being in a marriage if you're still going to be lacking the things that you wanted to get married for? Fulfill them. And then you will be walking in righteousness because you won't be desiring things that are sinful. Because the only thing that you can desire sexually that is sinful, if you're a married person, the only sexual thing that you can desire that is sinful is desiring someone other than your spouse. That's the only thing that you can desire sexually that is sinful if you're a married person. Only thing. So he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. We, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Man, your wife is not your enemy. You may think that she is sometimes, but she's not. And woman, your husband is not your enemy. The enemy is the one who has put a wedge between you, driven a wedge between you two by suggesting things into your mind that are contrary to the word of God. And it should be, it shouldn't be you against him, wife, or husband. It shouldn't be uh, you against her. It should be you and her against the common enemy. If you are married, two are better than one. If you are married, you should be standing with your wife, with your husband, against your common enemy. And if you are against your wife or your husband, then your enemy has pitted you against each other. That's kind of silly, isn't it? It's not silly in a comical sense. It's silly in a ridiculous sense. Why would you be pitted against each other? You married one another so that you could be you and he against the world, you and she against the world. And now you're pitted against each other? There's a problem there. And if there's a problem there, then you and she are grown-ups and you are Christians. And if you get in the Word of God, you will be able to figure out the problem and eradicate the problem. And then you will be standing with your wife or husband against your common foe. Which is exactly what he doesn't want. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. They are the ones that inspired people to write lies like the New International Version and tell you lies from the pulpit like there are certain things that you shouldn't do with your wife or your husband in bed because that would be a sin. That is a lie. That is a lie. I will say it again. There is nothing that God has ever said in his word. There is not one word of the Holy Scripture that forbids you as a married person to do anything that you want to do with your wife or husband. Nothing. Nothing. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. You cannot defile your marriage bed with your spouse. You cannot. Try as you might, and I challenge you to try. Stay up all night. Invent things. Do whatever you want to do. You cannot defile your marriage bed with your spouse. It cannot be done. I challenge you to try it. It cannot be done. And the devil is the one that told you that it could be done. He is the liar, the father of lies. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. Wherefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. What, boys and girls, when you have the armor of God on you, what does the scripture say? That you shall be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. When you have this armor on, you shall be able to stand. When you don't have this armor on, or if it's on crooked, or if it is cracked, or if it is falling off of you, then you shall not be able to stand on the battlefield. But when you have your armor on, properly, buckled on tight and properly placed, then you can stand against your enemy. And when Jesus Christ is your Lord, there is nothing that can come against you and prosper. No, prosper. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. No weapon. No, did you hear me? No weapon. 
No weapon of man, no weapon of, of nations, no weapon of devils, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper if you are standing clothed in the armor of God, girded with the armor that God has given you. Let's look at it. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Okay? Having your loins girt about with truth. Your loins are girt with a what we call today a belt. Your loins girt about with truth. When Paul's comparing this to a Roman soldier, obviously, because he lived in the times when, when these when, when the soldiers were, you know, the Romans, and they had a belt where they hung their weapons. The belt also held up their pants or their whatever they had on their, you know, even some of them wore kilts, I guess, which is not a godly thing, but they did. And it held that up so that they weren't naked, of course. And it also held on the bottom part of their breastplate. Okay, the belt is truth, the truth of the Word of God. The truth. Okay, not the New International Version, not the New American Standard Bible, not the, you know, today's English version, not any of those other versions. What the Bible says, the Holy Bible, the King James Version, the Word of God in English, the truth. When you have the truth and then a lie comes to you, you will know the lie instantly and you will reject it. This is what we were talking about earlier when the scripture says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, correction, reproof, and instruction in righteousness. And that's what we've been reading. Doctrine, correction, reproof, and instruction in what, boys and girls? Righteousness. Righteousness. Everything that has been discussed in this video is pertaining to righteousness. Get that through your head. Get it through your heart. Sexual intimacy between you and your spouse is not unclean. It is not sin. It is not dirty. It is holy. And it is as it was intended to be. That's why God made your bodies the way he did. And that's why God ordained marriage between a man and a woman. And that's why God ordained that the sexual intimacy between a man and a woman brings forth life. Praise the Lord. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, excuse me, withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on what? The breastplate of righteousness. When you stand before your enemy with the breastplate of righteousness on, swing as he might. If he gets past your shield and even begins to touch your chest area with his sword, it's going to go bing, it's going to bounce right off because you have the breastplate of righteousness. A sword cannot penetrate that. The sword of your enemy, the arrows of your enemy, the darts of your enemy cannot penetrate the breastplate of righteousness. In fact, you can even move your shield and go, here I am, bing, they just bounce off. They cannot penetrate your, your, your vital organs when you have your breastplate on because your breastplate is your righteousness. And when we have confidence before God, then we can ask him anything according to his will. And then he is glorified. Remember Jesus said, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, then ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be given you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, and so shall, be, so shall ye be my disciples. In John 15. So if your breastplate is broken because you're not getting that which you need from your wife or your husband and you're desiring it from somewhere else, then you're living in guilt you're living in frustration, you're living in shame, and your breastplate of righteousness is not on. And you cannot ask God for anything because you don't have confidence before Him because you know that you're living in sin. This is the doctrine of Balaam, brothers and sisters. Do you see how it works? So having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith in what? Faith in the Word of God. Okay? By faith in the Word of God, we understand that the marriage bed is undefiled. But if we don't have faith in the Word of God, then we'll believe lies like the NIV that says marriage should be honored by all and the bed kept pure. That's a lie. But if we know the Word of God, then we have the sword of the Spirit and we have the shield of faith because we believe the Word of God. We not only know the Word of God, if we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, but we believe the Word of God. That is our shield of faith. See, it's not enough just to know the Word of God. <laughs> you have to believe it. Believe it. 
what do you mean, Brother Clinton? How do I believe it? How do I have faith? It's very simple. Just read it and believe it. Just accept it as true and do what it says. That's how you believe it. It's not some magical force that you have to just conjure up. You just believe it and you do it. You, you read it and you decide that it's true and then you act accordingly. That's faith. It's just that simple. Praise the Lord. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. All, all, every single one. When you are abiding with this armor uh, put on you, when you are dressed in this armor, girded with this armor, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked because you are standing in righteousness. Because you are happy, you are blessed, you are fulfilled, you are strong in the Lord. You not only have great intimacy with your wife or your husband, but you also have wonderful time in the Word, by your, both by yourself and with your spouse, and in prayer, both by yourself and with your spouse. And so you are strong in the Lord, you are impenetrable. There is not one single crack in your armor, and there is no way that your enemy can slip one of his fiery darts into your body, because you are covered. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And take the helmet of salvation, verse 17, which is the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praise the Lord. My brothers, my sisters, I don't even know how long I've been speaking here. Let me look at it. Wow, it's been an hour and a half. Hour and a half. I expected this video to be like 15 minutes, but I prayed about it before I turned on the camera. And, and I, I trust that God has caused it to, to be this long on purpose, His purpose. And I trust that this is going to be a blessing to many of you. This is, has turned out to be not just a short video message, but a sermon, and, a, and quite a lengthy one, but one that needed to be preached, one that needs to be preached today in the churches, so that people who are married can live in the victory that God has ordained for married people, so that you can live above the fears that have been placed in your heart by your mother, your father, your grandfather, the traditions of your denomination, um, false Bible versions, false pastors, false religions, and every other false thing in this world, so that you can understand and obey the Word of God, and not only understand and obey the Word of God, but realize the freedom and the privileges that you have in your marriage that God has given you, and that He has wanted all this time for you to wake up and realize, so that you can enjoy these things and live fulfilled, fulfilled, satisfied with your wife or your husband, and then victorious because of that in every other area of your life. Of course, as you serve the Lord Jesus Christ and abide in his word in other areas as well, you have to obey the Lord in all things, not just in marriage, but um, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and that they may enter in through the gates into the city, Revelation twenty two fourteen. That's the culmination of the whole Bible. I mean, it's written in the middle of the Bible, too, in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, I think. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And if you will fear God and keep his commandments, then you will be blessed. And if you will understand and take to heart and take into the center of your marriage the things that I have shared with you in this video, you will be blessed. Now, I just want to take a couple minutes at the end of this video to speak to those of you who are not married or to those of you who are married but your spouse is not with you, your spouse has divorced you. It's very difficult to be alone without a spouse, whether you're a man or a woman. I totally understand these things. There are some of you who are not free to marry right now, and you are welcome to write to me, and I will be happy to pray in agreement with you that God would bless you and strengthen you and, and make a way in His grace and mercy for you to be free. And, I, I, and we don't ask God to take anybody's life from the earth, of course. But we ask, we can ask God, it's okay for us to ask God, if he would make a way for you to be free so that you can have a wife or a husband if you're a godly man or a godly woman. And God will honor that prayer. Um, for those of you who are free to marry, if you're, if you're a man and your wife has left you, she's divorced you, she doesn't want anything to do with you, um, I don't really recommend that you take another wife, but there's nothing unlawful about it. And if God presents you with a good godly wife, then you are free to take another wife and marry her, um, as long as you haven't put away your wife to marry another. But if your wife has left you and wants nothing to do with you, um, then you are free to take another wife. That doesn't mean that you are going to be a divorced man and have an ex-wife and a new wife. That means that you will be the husband of two wives, one who is living with you and one who is not. 
Okay, and if your first wife decides that she wants to come back to you and live with you and serve you as, as her husband, then you will be a man living with two wives in the same house, which could be a difficult situation for many obvious reasons. So I don't recommend that you seek another wife. In fact, the, the scripture says, Art thou loose from a wife, seek not a wife. Um, however, it is not unlawful for you to take another wife if the Lord provides for you one. Uh, for those of you who haven't been married yet, um, the things that I've shared in this video are, are, are wonderful for you to learn beforehand, before you even get married. It's wonderful if you haven't been married yet. It's wonderful that you've gotten to this point in this video and that you have learned and understood these things so that you can be prepared to enter into a marriage with the knowledge of these things coming from a 54-year-old Christian man who has been living as a married man and also as, a, as an ordained of God teacher of the Holy Word of God. And so you have the benefit of knowing these things before you even enter into a marriage, which is going to make your marriage dynamite when, when, you, when you enter into it. Because when, you are, when, you, when God gives you your wife or your husband and you are able to share with them these things, especially I'm speaking to you men, when God gives you a wife, a good godly woman, and you're able to teach her these things, she's going to marvel at you. and She's going to say, wow, where did you get this wisdom? How did you understand all these things? You understand who I am. You understand what I need. And you can just tell her, uh, the Word of God reveals these things. And a man of God understands these things. And, and she, will she, will, she will be so in love with you because you'll be able, as a man of God, to know what her needs are and to, and to give her that which she has need of and also to show her how to give you that which you have need of. And also, for those of you who are not married yet, this is a wonderful thing for you to learn in order to avoid marrying a woman who is not going to be in agreement with these things. Because you can talk to a woman, if you're thinking of marrying her, about these things, and if you see that she doesn't understand these things or is unwilling to believe or, or obey these things, then you know that that's not someone that you should consider marrying. And then you can just tell her, well, you know, I, I love you very much and I'll pray for you, but I uh, don't think we should continue to talk about marriage because we're not compatible in that sense. So this is a wonderful thing for those of you who are not married to know right now, to look, know and be established in. Um, for those of you who are not Christians, this might have been uh, there. There might have been parts of this video that were that seemed wrong to you or that seemed offensive to you. Um, and I have no apology for my father's word. If you have earnest questions, you're welcome to put your post your question in the comment section as long as it doesn't have any unacceptable elements, like I mentioned in the beginning of this video. And I'll be happy to answer your question. Or you can write me an email, and um, that would probably be best concerning the concerning the fact that, that we're talking about a, an issue which is kind of sensitive and personal. So my email address is always right below in the information box. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Jesus Christ, I am Brother Clinton, and I'm here for you as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope this has been a blessing to you. It sure has been a blessing to me. Have a blessed day or evening or morning, and continue in the word and in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.